Well, welcome to Pack Chatter Podcast. We have a great show tonight, and as part of our Tokyo 2020 series that we've been doing and looking at track discipline, um, both behind the scenes and athletes as we prepare for the 2020 Olympics, um, we have Nate Koch with us tonight. Uh, Nate has been on the forefront of what's been going on in the track world uh, as a racer, um, uh, namely in the six-day uh, element, and um, now he's still involved. He's over in London uh, currently uh, doing the London six-day. Hopefully we'll get to see some, some coverage that he'll post from that, as well as the Berlin six coming up uh, as well. But uh, really exciting stuff, really great to see you know, what he's uh, what he's seeing and uh, where the track cycling is going, especially coming off of uh, a lot of victories at the Pan Am Cycling Championships uh, a month ago and, uh, and our road uh, championships. So uh, seeing a lot from the younger riders and uh, being able to get uh, Nate's uh, take on where track cycling is going to fit in the future um, and the the excitement building uh, globally around that uh, that discipline so sit back and enjoy a great conversation with with nader and uh, of course uh, there'll be some links and things to his his uh, initiatives and uh, the work that he's doing um, beyond his racing these days as well so enjoy you'll never go out on a training ride and dig that deep awesome we we won gold we they're they're life ride like Dude, I'm still figuring this out. We lose sight of the fact that it's it's whoever goes faster. Yo, know, this isn't a road race. This isn't a mountain bike race. The sensei of sprint, Todd Jeffy. My eyes are coming out of my head. Just get in here. Oh, let's dig in a little bit. So this is our little little background. Um, because you know, um, track is obviously. I mean, this is kind of our focus is building up for for uh, Olympics and track and um and Europe pretty prominent figure um even these days on the on the on the track still and in that in those in those circles so uh, no pun intended um yeah. but uh but uh, you you started out just getting so let's give people a little background i know if i think of decathlon i, I can obviously say well it's 10 events but what what is it i mean and, and so like you know what what are the events and and explain it a, a little give us give us the fifty thousand foot view of what the heck is decathlon yeah so i mean it is 10 events in two days all track and field events so uh, a combination of sprinting jumping and throwing and every event is different so there's four running events you have a short 100 meters of uh long sprint 400 meters then you have the hurdles and then you end with the 1500 meters so uh, a full gamut there and then the throwing you have uh, shot put, discus, and javelin, so three different types of throwing. And then you got long jump, high jump, pole vault, so three different types of uh, jumping. So really just, I mean, it's a, a technician's nightmare as far, or dream, depending on how <laughs> yeah. you look at it. But um, I mean, it's one of those things where you're training four, six hours a day, whether it's just going through drills and doing stuff or lifting or running or, or whatever. So just it takes years and years and years to catch on. Yeah, and like, and so I mean, you think about it, like, you know, I always think triathlon is is a lot to to prepare for with three different events, and but now you got these ten, and so so what? what how do you? I mean, you got to give a little bit of focus to something, right? I mean, because you, you can't just you can't give equal time to everything. So some things are kind of spillovers to others, or yeah. I mean, you kind of. I mean, first things first, you look at the events and look at the point breakdown and and see like, okay where is there big points to be made and that's mostly sprints and jumps um and then you look at the the shot put or discus or whatever unless you're just an absolute monster you're not gonna really make leaps and bounds in those like you would in the hurdles or the pole vault or something like that so you focus there where you can get the the biggest return on your investment uh right. and then i mean it's really just a matter of yeah, trying to work things in like, OK, I, I need to practice four events today, but what can I do to kind of bleed all those together? You you warm up doing shot put drills and then you go over and do your long jump mechanics and that kind of stuff. And then you do your running workout and then you lift. Um, so just trying to be as efficient and, and technically sound. Um, it's just yeah, it's it's just about efficiency over all the events and you only got so many days and hours in a week so uh and your yeah. body can only take so much sure and, and when you run 
a decathlon i mean how how long is it like all in one day is it spread out over two days how do they how do they so, organize yeah, it's, it it's it's two days um and basically the way it works is you you have from the ending of one event to the start of the next event there has to be one hour uh i believe it's one hour break um and that includes like so say you finish the 100 meters and then the next event's the long jump from the finish to the start means you got to like kind of clear your head, do whatever, and then go over to the long jump and get your mark and make sure everything's good. So you're you're not like sitting for an hour waiting for the next event to start like you're now, now starting to set up and prep for that event, make sure your your steps are on and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's an endurance event too. I mean, you're yeah. out there 12 hours a day for two days straight, and uh, it's yeah, it, it's that's that's the part that um, I, I really liked. I mean, you see who can who can hold it together day two after the pole vault um, because the pole vault's typically the most technical event, and then it's the eighth event. Um, and so it can make or break a lot of people. Um, so I liked that part of it because I could just turn it on and be like, all right, it's, it's going to happen or it's not. So it's just up to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's an, that's an intensive event. And so, and, uh, and it's, it is interesting that pole vault is in there. Um, I did track when I was in high school, but not nothing to that level. I just, I just ran a couple of events. <laughs> I yeah. didn't really, I didn't throw stuff or right. But we <laughs> go, we'd be goofing around at the pole vault there. Right. And I'd be like, I'm like, Oh yeah, I think I'm gonna do, I dude, I couldn't get more than like seven feet off the ground. Right. It's, I mean, it's like people can high jump more than I can pole vault. Right? Yeah. That's an intense event, man. So, like so like what was your what's your highest pole vault uh i hit 15 six was Ooh. my personal best so yeah i was oh. i mean as my pole vault coach always said it was flashes of brilliance and periods of despair um <laughs> so uh especially with a decathlete like i'd be when i was hot i was hot and when i wasn't i wasn't so and that's where like i i, I jumped over 15 feet but for a decathlon, like I would do my first jump at 12 foot, make sure I make a height to get points and right. then skip three or four heights and then come back in. Um, so there's, yeah, the technique there to making sure, because if you get no points in an event, you're just SOL and pack your bags. Right, so, right. It's a, which it's I've done that too. <laughs> that, that was one of the so, moments of despair. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, Definitely. no doubt. So that's uh, that's an intense. Uh, and you got a scholarship for uh, for a full ride. Was that for the decathlon yeah. to, to run the? Ta oh, excellent. So so what brought you out of decathlon and and into the crazy world of track cycling? And then and then you get even a transition from there into six days. Yeah. So, so how, how did all that transpire? Yeah, I, so yeah, I was running track at Cal State Long Beach, uh, and just after so many different injuries and issues there, um, my scholarship was coming, into, and I was hanging on by a thread, like physically, uh, and, and so several guys, Gideon Mossy, Travis Smith, Adam Duvendeck, lifted in the weight room that I lifted in at Cal State Long Beach, and so after rehabbing my ACL, uh, on the bike, I knew a little bit about cycling. My dad's always ridden a little bit. Um, so I knew the, the jargon, the lingo a bit, but I knew nothing about track cycling or velodromes. And so when they would come in, we'd kind of ham it up a little bit. We're close to the same age. Uh, and, and basically I told them like, yeah, maybe, maybe when I'm done running, like I can try this velodrome thing and, uh, see what happens. And so, uh, I think Travis Smith and I became kind of friends the most and so as soon as I was done running scholarship was up uh I got a hold of Travis and figured stuff out and then a guy named Tony Cruz in Long Beach he raced on the U.S. Postal team and uh U.S. National Crit champion and or road race champion and crit I think but monster um he got me my first uh, track bike or helped me get it uh and so yeah I just had a lot of support and just dove in Head first, basically. But you had a really quick ascent too from there, um, and found yourself soon on the national team. 
So it was it a second at nationals and then Pan Am win or I don't know the order that that went in um, for you. Yeah, I don't um, need, I know my sprint. Yeah, my first nationals. Um, I mean, I I think I got. I don't, I don't think I got anything the first year. I got fifth or sixth or something on my team sprint team um, because all the um, more senior riders were spoken for. Uh, and so I hadn't proven myself yet. Um, but, yeah, basically a year and a half after that um, is when, yeah, we broke the American record in the team sprint. And so I think that next year, uh, I think we won – we won that year at nationals, uh, and then I got a second and a third and a first and in team sprint. So, yeah, a, a handful of things. But basically, yeah. I mean, I, I was really fortunate to have Jamie's staff at the track running the national team, and he had an open-door policy for those who showed some talent, showed some potential to – at least give them the time of day to see like if, if it would amount to anything. And so um, myself and others showed up and some of them didn't last and some of us did and uh, we just kind of, yeah, had to prove yourself. And so for me, it, it worked out. Yeah, well, I think say you definitely, you definitely more than proved yourself. And when you started setting uh, new new records and uh, and uh, meddling at, at NAMS, that's that's pretty good proof. Um, I don't think <laughs> anybody would question that. So, uh, but then that led into six days for you as well, and and that's and that's a whole different game in itself, right? I mean, it's it's not uh, it's not the UCI structure of events and things, and kind of a whole different world. And how how is that different? And how did how did you how did you kind of transition into that? How did that that come about for you? Yeah. So I was after what was it? February 2013. Um, Kevin Mansker, Matt Baranowski, and myself broke the national record at Pan Ams. Uh, and, and so that was directly after the Olympics. And it's like, okay, we're three and a half years out of the next Olympics. Like this, this looks good to have some momentum, have some potential moving forward. Um, unfortunately for us, the BMX side uh, tanked in uh, London. And so basically USA Cycling poached Jamie staff from the sprint program, took him over to BMX, uh, reconfigured everything, basically just like, how can we make things as cut and dry for qualifications to be on the team? Uh, but that meant those qualifications didn't necessarily make sense. Um, like for my, my qualification for man one was, uh, flying 200 meter. Uh, and that's, it doesn't really add up like uh, uh, the best starters in the world. They can do an okay 200, but they're no means like qualifying <laughs> top 18, even uh, at a world cup or world championships, especially the Olympics. So um, basically I just, I had to switch my focus then to sprints and Kieran because that was the only way I could maybe move forward on the national team. Uh, so I started doing that, got second at nationals in the Kieran. So it was progressing well. I was always better in the Kieran than I was in the sprints. Uh, and then basically I shot Max Levy a message on Facebook and I still have, I have a screenshot of the message and his response. And, um, basically he got back and he said, thanks for the message. I'd, I'd raced bef the summer before in Germany, but I, in Cottbus where Max lives, but I didn't get to meet him or know him or anything like that. Um, and so I got a message back saying like, thanks for the message, but we got everybody we need. So uh, chalked it up as that's not going to happen. And so then in like first week of January, because Berlin's always last week of January, I get a message from Levy saying like hey uh one of the riders dropped out or has a back injury uh we're looking for one more person uh would you like to race in berlin uh and so i knew that if i said no i'd never get that opportunity again to race at a six day uh sure. it, it's a very very small select group and they're very uh at least in berlin they're they're 
they pick and choose specific people to create the atmosphere and create the show. Um, and, and then obviously make sure the racing is good as well. And so they didn't really know me or whatnot. I, I just kind of, I got lucky there. I think they thought like, okay, we can bring this dude over. America looks, sounds good. And we can pay him close to nothing because it's his first one. Right. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> right. so basically I said yes. And uh, the rest is kind of, Kind of history, and then I found out later that the person that uh, had the back industry injury, who I replaced, was Robert Forstman. So that's always uh, ah, fun to to say that I took over Robert Forstman's <laughs> spot. Uh, filled and in did not him. disappoint. So you filled in. You filled in. You were his backup, and uh, and you had the opportunity to go there. And uh, like you said, because it is this kind of this small thing, and you also developed yourself. Your 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 nickname is the Showman from from there, <laughs> right? I mean, so you really kind of embraced the the entertainment and and really what they're trying to do with the six day as opposed to going out there and just trying to win every race that you're in is really putting on that show and um and do you think you're like some of your decathlon on kind of background kind of plays into this sort of like you can kind of be the jack of all trades out there right where you're kind of like you know i'm not i'm not the guy waiting i'm not the guy just riding wheels waiting for the end or i'm not the guy that's always gonna go along you're, you're mixing it up you're doing you're doing whatever yeah, to make the show i yeah, I'd say it, it's pretty multifaceted or layered, but I first and foremost, I knew I was the only one without rainbow stripes or an Olympic medal to my name uh, in the lineup. So that that made me need to uh, show some other sort of value. <laughs> so, right. um, but I really I just I went into Berlin really like genuinely thinking this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and I'm going to make the absolute absolute most out of it because it's never going to happen again and so i was like standing on the apron gopro filming stuff and like just i mean i was like a kid in a candy store walking around talking to people like people thought i was important so i'm like yeah i'll take pictures like oh you want an autograph too like i thought it was classic and just i'm like this is never going to happen again so i might as well just soak it up and uh, see what happens so um, yeah, and so I think it was like after day three, um, I kind of started to get some momentum from the people who were there night after night. And then uh, day four, one of the Berlin newspapers wrote a uh, article about me, like the, the American with the big beard and whatever else. And I mean, really, I was just kind of I was having fun. I was being myself and and. I was taking a lot of knowledge and guidance from Max Levy, who is the ultimate showman. Uh, I mean, that guy knows how to work a crowd and and really uh, just put on an incredible show. So I, I learned and just I was quiet. I watched. I learned and it worked out. Yeah, and I think I think one of the things too is like maybe there's a misconception people don't understand six days is well it's a show but that's world class racing still I mean no those guys aren't <laughs> they're not putting around out there at like forty k an hour right it's 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 full it's full on when it's going it, it's going it's, yeah it's it's full gas and it's the good thing is we we all sign a contract beforehand we know how much we're getting paid so we're not worried about getting results. Uh, and then none of you don't get like UCI or Olympic points for doing that. So really, it's just a fun way to get paid. And so you can make extra money if you get results from like your own personal sponsors, which always helped and was nice. Uh, but you can go out and it's six nights in a row. So it's not like, all right, here's my one Kieran. Like, that's right. all I got. You do a Kieran every night. So um, you hope that you get one or two opportunities to get some good placing throughout the week and um yeah and just really yeah it's pretty lighthearted and and fun and all the sprinters are in cabins together hanging out and it's not it's not like you won't have your own area your own warm-up stuff um and you're that focused like you would be at a world cup or world championships or olympics right. but it's just it's a community it's a family right right I mean, this you get this call beginning of January. I mean, are, are how are you feeling like prepared wise? I mean, do you put the phone down and be like, "Holy crap, 
I got like three weeks to get ready because I haven't been racing because you know, I'm planning on doing this for- thing. Or, or, or. For- fortunately, I was literally in uh, Milton for the opening of their velodrome doing a race. So I think I went 10 7 there. Um, so I was where I needed to be. I mean, 10 7 for me was a good 200 time. Um, good and time. that was good enough for them. I mean, they they pretty much said like that's fast enough there but what's most important to us is we can say and promote that you're a u.s national champion you're an american record holder you got third at pan ams like you have some credibility behind your name uh and then you're not gonna go too slow Um, so so yeah i i was very fortunate to have some of those accolades and then yeah i was I was in shape, I was racing. And so it was just kind of, it was weird for me to be in one country, come home for a week and then leave to Germany. That was, that was definitely something new. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's one of those things you look down and say, man, that's just a lot of things clicking together. You know, the the Pan Am championships in uh, Bolivia, right? Nine one people and like the top 18 are all like, man, if you're not breaking 10, you know, it's been nice, nice to have you come down, you know, but it's like, do you think, like the the flying 200 is perhaps becoming its own event and outside of sprinting yeah i mean it's tough to say because at at lower levels when you get like a couple people that are going way faster and this that and the other and all they focus on is the time trial and and they can just kind of time trial past everybody else in the sprint rounds um then yes but when you get to that world class level where everybody is like fast and knows how to sprint then you have sprinting and tactics at that speed which yeah. is just absolute mind blowing um so until you get to those very very top upper echelons of racers who can do the times and they can tactically uh move their bike around uh then then it's not its own event and it's not just the time trial like everybody's going fast everybody knows what they're doing and then you got somebody like max levy who what was it last year i think he qualified 18th uh and then came through and beat jeffrey hoogland who was the top seed and then ended up i think this was at the world championships last year and then ended up getting like third in the sprint after qualifying 18th so um right. it just shows that if you know how to race and you know how to move your bike around, uh, anything can be possible, which is pretty mind blowing. Like the, the cream still comes to the top kind of thing, right? So even if guys are really getting really specialized in in, in that flying two hundred, they even if they get in the round, they're not going to stay in the rounds. And I think uh, yeah. I think Christina Vogel did the last Olympics, or if I'm not mistaken, where she didn't qualify well, but then wins, right? Because she knows yeah. she knows what she was doing. Because she can, you know. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. So, so it's one and of those then, things where you say, yeah. On the other side, like a, an an example, James Mellon um, at Pan Am's going nine five, incredibly fast. Uh, at nationals, he went, I don't know what it was, ten two here, uh, and so was like head and shoulders above most of the others. And um, James has a lot of experience to gain in sprinting and tactics and so he can do a great time trial and he can get into the rounds but uh he he's quickly dismissed unfortunately until he figures out how to use tactics with his speed so um it just shows there's a lot of people who can make the bike go fast and that's good but uh once you get to the top levels it's much more than that Right, right, and I think that's just uh, it's it's an important aspect of it, and I think in some regard it kind of, you know, it ties together a little bit with you know when you were on the national team, also they make they make this requirement then of like the flying two hundred, which is really not applicable to what you were doing as a starter, because um, you're doing a standing start as the as man one on it. Yeah, in the sprint. You're, you're not, not doing a flying make, start, so yeah, you're not going to make Usain Bolt do a four hundred meter for his uh benchmark to run the 100 meters that's just not how it works <laughs> right so. <laughs> right so yeah, right a little misapplied there so um but it yeah. did open up some opportunities so although that that happened i kind of think coming in with they're changing up kind of how the season 
um, when it's going to be as far as the indoor season, moving more towards summer. Um, and how, how does that play in with the six days and with your experience there? And how do you think all that plays together? And is it good or bad? And how do you see that playing out? Yeah, well, most people see it as a negative, um, mostly because they're taking away trade teams. And trade teams are the lifeblood of basically track cycling as a sport. They pay for everything. You get the the middle-aged men, women, whatever else with the money who like the trade teams. They follow them. They pay. They buy jerseys all that kind of stuff and so now it's putting that burden 100 percent on the governing bodies uh which i think is probably more than they want more than they they have and are capable of and i think it's going to open up an unfortunate amount of um maybe favoritism and and more political things the cool thing with the trade team is you could kind of loophole some of the political stuff to still race, still qualify, and, and move forward um, the way you'd want to try and go uh, to the Olympics. And then UCI coming out with, uh, talking about coming out with some sort of racing that's more entertainment-based. Um, I, I, I personally feel they should stick to what they do, um, which is putting on high-level, focused racing that leads people to the olympics and leave the entertaining to a a company like six day cycling who does entertaining uh don't try and stick your fingers in everything and and just stick to what you're good at and maybe try and make it better right right and it seems like they're kind of seems a little bit of a power play and and like you said you know you have six day cycling as an organization and what about world cycling league is is kind of vying for some base there too right at least as far as this country goes and and you know how does that play in in your view yeah well i mean to be very business about it it doesn't play in until they actually create some events and get some momentum um i hope that it happens i hope that it comes to fruition uh i i did the very first um race that they had here in la and it was super fun the team track uh format was really cool really entertaining um but unfortunately i don't how what was that four years ago or something now yeah Um, yeah four or five years and and there's been zero public movement um i'm sure there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes trying to uh acquire funds finances whatnot but um yeah as of right now they're they're not even in the game because they they don't have anything to be put on six day cycling is the premier entertainment um in cycling for especially track revolution folded so that doesn't have any play anymore either so um it'll be interesting to see what what the uci even pitches or comes up with or or says they're rolling out right right well it looks like six day cycling it's really um it's it's almost uh them versus uci and some um, but six day cycling is going to have the funding if if you know what you're saying is (laughs) is on point right and you're gonna you know they're gonna have the leverage now to to move forward and and it's gonna they're also gonna be incentivized if CI is kind of moving in on their entertainment turf. And they're going to be incentivized to expand that and quickly um, to grab that muscle away. Where are they going to be in six day cycling? I would think would be poised to to really ramp up and 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 grab that market share. So, um, and like you said, World Cycling League has has been it kind of fits and starts. Um, so it really kind of sets, you only have one player really, um, sets them in a really great spot. Um, and it, when, as far as you're concerned, I mean, you're, you are tied somewhat with six day cycling too. You've done some, some, uh, commentating and some, uh, some promotional work last winter. I recall seeing a lot on social media from Berlin and so forth, which was fantastic coverage. I mean, that was like, that was probably the best thing on Facebook at any, any week was seeing that stuff coming through. And I loved watching that just the kind of field and the energy that was coming out of that. Um, so, um, you know, where do you think, is, is there a future with six day cycling and, and perhaps in this country. I hope so. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going back to London again 
uh, in a couple weeks uh, for the six day there. So I'm happy to continue to be a part of that. And I hope that I can play a part in six days making their way back to the US. I know that six day cycling 100% has that set on their to do list, um, but they're smart and they're they are um, calculated and they understand that you only get one shot with the American market and you got to do it correctly. Uh, and, and it's got to be televised and promoted correctly. You can't just if they come in and do it, they're going to want to come in with a bang, for example, like bringing in a track to Madison Square Garden, putting it in there, having it televised on NBC or whatever it is, and like make it a big freaking deal, uh, not kind of start low and work your way up. That's what they're doing with all the other, all the other six days are building up and, and trying to build momentum to bring this back to the United States and, and to be able to get the funding and get the backing and, and be able to go televised with it in the United States. So all the other countries and things, they're kind of working, working the kinks out and figuring it out uh, so that when they come back to the U.S., it's plug and play and they're ready to rock and roll and it's going to... Um, just be a big, big thing very quickly. Yeah, well, I reshared it on Facebook the other day from about Peter Junick and the tracks that he's been building, um, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, he and he's got some some uh, plans for uh, you know building those removable tracks, which could be a really huge deal for either World Cycling League or a six day cycling, because now you can start placing these things in arenas, really pumping that um, as a as a venue. So um, I've ridden some of his early tracks, and I think he's refined it since then. Um, his very first one in Font Hill is like an hour and a half from my house. Oh, cool. Uh, and it was in the corner of this little park and it was plywood and I wrote it after I'd been there a couple of years in the weather and you know there was oh yeah <laughs> big pieces of plywood <laughs> yeah and, it and had it was character real warpy and yes yes it definitely had character first track I ever rode on and uh, so uh, he's come a long way and he's even got this idea about some some aluminum uh, surface uh, and keeping the weight down but giving the rigidity really cool stuff so maybe there's a maybe there's a pl- play going on there too when you start talking about placing in a big market and you know being able to put it in and take it out so yeah um yeah. The 2028 la olympics um that's uh that, that'd be a, that'd be a little bit of a haul out there but uh but you got some other stuff in the works so what, what, tell us what you've been working on you got some cool stuff um are you alluding to on your left Yes, I am. Okay. I, I, I didn't, <laughs> I I didn't want to steal it. your thunder and say it, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we. I mean, we. when you were out here for Masters Nats, we talked about it, but it wasn't public yet. And so, yeah, I, I lost my dog, um, I don't even know now, a month and a half ago. Uh, Chewy, he's kind of, for Long Beach Bike Fit, my business, he's my logo, the little dog on the bike. Um, and he was my buddy, went everywhere, and... Um, but yeah, I had some health issues. And, um, so anyways, I basically, I wanted a way to try and immortalize Chewy. And so I, I had been thinking about how I can do that. And I, I had the idea of on your left for a while for some other stuff. Um, but then it kind of took a turn and, and took shape, um, after that. And so basically the idea behind on your left is, trying to create and cultivate better community in um, activity, whether it's cycling or running or triathlon or swimming or volunteering at events, mud run stuff, like whatever it is. Uh, The whole idea behind On Your Left isn't what it's typically thought of or known as is like somebody flying by you on your left-hand side screaming at you to get out of the way, but more so on your left like hey i'm here to help you hand on the lower back pushing you up the hill um on my instagram on your left official like i've posted a handful of pictures uh one of them was two marathon runners uh one on the uh right hand side had like half an arm half arms basically no hands and the person on his left was handing him a water bottle while they're running uh and so that exemplifies the culture and 
the mindset that I, I want to try and just build, create, instill, and, and uh, have for for life and for people. And so, yeah, that's what, I mean, that's what Chewie had as a dog. Like, we go to the dog park, he would sit on other people's laps and go up to other people to get pet and, like, just, just really be there. Um, and so... Yeah, on your left is uh, on your left.com. You can check it out. Right now, it's just starting out slowly with some different apparel and things like that. And then I have some bigger ideas um, to hopefully make it um, throughout the US uh, and then maybe globally eventually, not just with apparel, but with actual um, sites essentially. So. Right. A lot and to lot 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 might happen, so we'll see. Yeah, so you're kind of letting it letting it navigate itself a little bit in the beginning and kind of find mm. kind of your cool idea, especially when you look at like road cycling. I mean, and sometimes compared to track cycling, I always said that track cycling is more of a more of an intimate sport. I mean, it's it's close between events and things. Yeah. Whereas road, sometimes it's like you kind of show up, feels a little cold, right? It's like you show up, yeah. you do your race, whatever, and you go home. Um, and it's always thought like track is a little more family, if if you will. Um. And so kind of maybe, you know, that branching that out and that, that thought of, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, how many times you've been at the track and people lend out cogs and chain rings and tools. And, you know, like I, I've had Bob Bice down at T-Town and I'm like, Bob, just make sure I get it back at the end of the night, you know, <laughs> but yeah. it's, but it's that, that, that. It's that idea of helping other people out. It's like, yeah, it's competitor and stuff too, but it, but at the end of the day, we all want to compete and be our best. And if it helps somebody, and I think you know, putting that forward and maybe getting that out into the road community, and like you said, you're even expanding that into other sports and as far as running or. Yeah, I don't want it to be cycling centric because I don't want to pigeonhole myself. And there's so many more people out there than just a cyclist. Uh, and and one of the things that I kind of had this epiphany a couple of weeks ago was. There's so many people who don't put a number on, never will, never really want to, but are running support and running volunteer uh, at track races or for Race Across America or for a 100-mile trail run or whatever else. So on your left, I mean, they are like what on your left exemplifies like those people helping and being a part of it and so giving them some sort of identification and uh, something to latch onto, and giving them resources so that they can better serve uh, that the way that they want and hope to because that's where their passion is in serving not suffering necessarily right, so right. Um, there's so much more to it than just cyclists or athlete, athletes or, or, or participants, um, but the families, the the friends, and then the volunteers that are all a part of that as well. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really, it's kind of this, it's this really cool thing, and I'm, and I'm still trying, I think maybe I'm mistaken, you're still kind of getting, not really putting your arms around it, but kind of finding what it, what it's going to become, but knowing what, mm-hmm. you, you, got a, you got something coming up this Sunday. Right. I think it's Sunday <laughs> that it's coming up. <laughs> is, is that what spurred, yeah. spurred this? <laughs> <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with this. I've always so I, I used to run. Obviously, I ran for 15 years, uh, and then once I started cycling, like I didn't run for almost 15 years, uh, and then like within the last year, I've started. I run maybe once or twice a week, like four to eight times a month, like no more than four or five miles. Um, and and I always just had this weird thought of like, man, I wonder if like how how would my body hold up what would happen if i just went out and ran a marathon tomorrow with like not being out of shape but definitely not being in marathon shape or or knowing uh and so the furthest run i've ever done is eight and a half miles and so this sunday um i'm running a marathon by myself uh it's not a race i'm not putting on a number i'm literally having a buddy ride next to me on a bike Uh, with a backpack and some water and some food and whatnot. He's going to do some video stuff too, uh, just to see. So it's just an out and back 13-1 both ways. Um, I put it on social media for any local people that want to come out and um, cheer me on or run with me or ride next to me or whatever else. So uh, it's just kind of a not even a challenge, but more of an adventure uh, that I can do in a morning um, because I'm not going to train for an Ironman with my family. And like, I don't, I don't have 
the capacity at the moment to want to train and and get a result and whatever else uh so this is a way to i guess just kind of see how my body reacts physically and then take myself somewhere uh mentally emotionally that i don't know if i've been yet uh and i can do it in four to five hours in a morning so right. it should be one <laughs> heck of an adventure <laughs> Right, right. Well, I think I think it will be. I was uh, I saw your uh, your live thing on it the other day, and I was like, "What? What? Are you, like, what are you? What are you going to do a marathon?" But like, dude, and uh, and it's it's funny when you kind of say like, you know, what's going to happen to your body? Is uh, I ran this elite team for a number of years here in uh, Western New York, and uh, as part of our sponsorship, is our sponsor put on was a was a title sponsor of, of a local. Mar- marathon and so they said well hey we have a cycling team we'd like you guys to chaperone the lead riders so you know they don't have to and uh, so but it was always interesting even the lead people how you how you'd watch the body just kind of getting torn apart in this marathon right and they're they're running these five minute miles early on yeah. and, and you just watch how it's getting choppier and harder and you get around that 20 21 miles and 20 is like the death mark right because that's where that's where it really starts to take take hold of it and you see people going from being like pretty pretty up on it to uh, really see it going down so it'll be interesting especially if you have some video going on and and it'll be good for you to look back on and be like yeah that was that was intense man <laughs> so, yeah so um, yeah my but hope- my buddy scott will be taking some video i'll be doing some live video on my phone it'll be in true nader fashion um just to I mean, it, it's not like i want to bring other people into the experience um that are interested i mean it's it's just uh, hopefully it's entertaining i'm sure it will be especially at mile 20 um and so (laughs) yeah just just kind of making making a small thing of it and making it fun uh and and uh yeah so there will definitely be some video for you to chuckle at oh this will be this will be great i'm actually i'm looking forward to seeing some of these and uh i think this will be this will be a kind of a cool uh maybe, maybe this kind of a cool kickoff for on your left too because you're gonna because your 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 buddy scott's gonna be there he's gonna be on your left almost quite yeah. quite literally um yeah. so it'll be uh i think it, maybe it's a, maybe it's a good tie in there and uh um uh, for you know kind of expanding that and then pushing it out because you haven't really rolled out on your left all that much right i've yeah i mean i've seen bits and pieces of it coming out yeah, I've done some just Facebook general stuff, um, really to make sure the website's up, running good, see what people think about the different designs and get some feedback there. But I haven't started like putting in a, any marketing or like really created a, a forward plan with it. And so this was essentially just hit my personal demographic, get some feelers about that, and then no moving forward once i'm actually investing putting money into it uh how to do it correctly the first time instead of like oh i lost ten thousand dollars on an idea that just i was doing wrong the whole time some of your six day stuff uh because i think that's uh those those were really really um insightful fun um and i think you know creating and maybe there's a whole blend play on that um and i'm sure you you think about it every day um but uh there's so many things that are interrelated with that with with bringing us close to the sport from that six day infield the on your left stuff and i just think there's there's a lot of compelling things that i think can and me and maybe that's even something uh, six days into as well um and uh you guys go forward uh, together and it's launching up and creating as a fun sport and it's it, not just fun, but exciting and thrilling and entertaining and all those things. So, um, so I, I'm excited to see where you go with it. Um, if you can't tell, Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm I am too, and yeah, I'm excited to yeah go over to London in a couple weeks and have some various shirts and stickers and whatnot. And so I'm officially international. Um, and so uh, yeah, it, it it it's pretty cool. And and one of the things again that I always tried to do at six days was try and almost seek out and latch on to um, the people who weren't already involved in the sport or fans or whatnot, but um, the kids or the people who are there for the first time, or, I mean, go hang out with the people working the door and talk to them and see if they got to get in and see any racing or whatever else Um, created some pretty cool relationships and friendships with um, the people that just work the event every year because they like the event but know nothing about cycling or have never even touched a velodrome so um yeah i'm excited to bring it to more people like that it reminds me a lot of uh, a friend of 
of mine, uh, old friend of mine, uh, John Deshaw, and he was very much like that. And uh, unfortunately, he was say he was killed by a driver a number of years ago. Um, but uh, but he was always the friendliest guy at a race, and he would always talk to. Uh, various people then not just the bike racers and i think you know there was always something like yeah why don't we take more time to just talk to people that are at the event you know the 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 corner marshal the start guy starting gate guy or whoever it is and you know sometimes we get so wrapped up with doing our thing that we've kind of forgot that there's people there and they have a story you know they might have a really cool story (laughs) yeah and they're giving their time for free most of the time too yeah so um yeah just giving Giving them the time of day is the very, very least we can do. So, and yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, coming back on, even after I was out there and uh, in Long Beach and and uh, and my my I had my technical difficulties. So I appreciate you carving out some time. I know you've been you've been bike fitting like crazy at your yeah, uh, Long Beach busy. bike fit, um, which is cool. And I I always say when people are like, man, business is awesome. I'm really busy. I'm like that. I'm always glad when people's business is going well and I'm like, good, because it's better than while I'm sitting around hoping work slides across my desk. Right. So, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Keeping it busy. So, well, thanks for having me on Todd. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out to me, don't hesitate to go on my various social media stuff. So Instagram, you can go on, on your left official or uh, team Nader. And then Facebook is there's the on your left uh, Long Beach bike fit. And then Nader here is the Facebook page for my athlete page. Um, so yeah, or you can just search me and probably find my phone number somewhere on the interwebs and just start calling me. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. So thanks, man. I appreciate I appreciate you wanting to chat. Awesome. Great, great to have you on. And uh, look forward to some great, great time. There's no turning.